let's return to This Week in America. Here's your host, Rick Bratton. Welcome back, everybody. Coast to coast, This Week in America. In 1948, Joseph Kinnebrew was a little boy, becoming aware of his place in a bigger world. Back then, well, his territory was small. He was maturing from age 6 to 8, living with his family on a steep hill running down to Commencement Bay in Tacoma, Washington. Joseph, in those days Joe, with his dog Skipper and their neighborhood pal Freddie with his dog Chipper, were serious adventurers, young boys, persons of curiosity. Joseph has been a professional painter and sculptor for over 55 years, for years as an internationally recognized artist. He wrote many artist statements. His efforts were intended to reach viewers with new insights and provocative ideas. For many years, he did large-scale commission sculptures and in the 70s was one of the most highly granted American artists by the National Endowment for the Arts in Washington, D.C., He's won many prestigious awards for his work and was the first recipient of the Michigan State Governor's Arts Award in, sculpture, in Sculpturing. More than just an artist, his unusual and highly acclaimed talents have been the subject of intense discussion and investigation. In 2014, he was a rare human subject in one of the most significant studies into extreme creative genius at the University of Iowa. Holds many patents, has done work in areas of theoretical mathematics, biology, and consulted with numerous architectural design firms. His works have been collected by many of the country's most prestigious fine art museums and libraries. Today, Joseph lives and works on a remote stretch of the Pacific Beach, Pacific Ocean Beach in Washington State, mentors people, and now only occasionally lectures. He's the author of several books of fiction and nonfiction, as well as white papers on various subjects. And one of those books, as I mentioned, the new book, Little Boys, Big Dreams, and the Hobo Wars by Joseph Kinnebrew, our guest on This Week in America. Joseph, welcome to the program. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. Now, with you is is Siri, and explain, uh, Siri is there. She's the director of Kinnebrew Studios and will be assisting with the interview. Siri, welcome to the program. And uh, again, Joseph, a pleasure to have you here. What a distinguished career that you've had. And this book is just one of many accomplishments in your lifetime. What was it like to write this book as a memoir, going back in your early days? What was this like for you? Well, it- I think there's a peculiar thing. Um, this is not a book about growing up. This is a book about just being there, being a, being there at that young age. Um, but in retrospect, because now I'm a little bit over 80 years old, and looking back, uh, it's interesting to see what that experience meant and how it has affected my life. Um, it was a pleasure to, that's all I can say, that writing the book was just a real pleasure. It was a, it was a pleasure to reflect on those events, um, those people, and the things that we learned, and especially Bobby, the older person who was handicapped in our neighborhood, who initially was a great mystery and actually a, a little scary to all of us young young boys yes. because he was infirmed and uh, didn't speak well. He had spinal bifida. But w- the profound effect he had on us, or at least I can say at this point, since I don't see any of those other Uh, friends of mine back in those days, Uh, but he had a profound effect on my life and how I see the world and how I believe I treat and think about other people. That's such a wonderful section of the book, and there are so many in Joseph's book. The book is available wherever books are sold and Joseph's website, josephkinnebrew.com. The book is Little Boys, Big Dreams, and the Hobo Wars by Joseph Kinnebrew, our guest on the program. Let's talk about what makes these memories so special, and you touched on this, and this laid the foundation, certainly in your life, for the success to come for the Joseph Kinnebrew that came out of those younger years. What was it like going back, and how long ago was this? I mentioned what you were six to eight years old at the time. Yes, actually, it was um, very end end of the forties. Life was much simpler oh, yes. in those days, and 
it, the subtext of the book was and the hobo wars. Um, I don't think that people today even know what a hobo is. We also call them tramps. But they were not, they were very different than the homeless people we see today. These were people post, um, post-World War II who chose uh, to travel and basically camp uh, together as a lifestyle. And they would frequently appear at our back door um, asking for food, and my mother would accommodate them, and then they would go to somebody else in the neighborhood. But they lived down in a gully that was at the end of our street. And initially, we were very afraid of them, and our mothers told, our mothers told us that we couldn't go into the gully because they kidnapped children <laughs> and put them in boxcars and, and sold them and sent them to Arabia. <laughs> we had no clue what Arabia was all about, except that they made slaves of children. And you knew you didn't want to go there. You did not want to end up in Arabia later that day. We certainly <laughs> did not. <laughs> well, you handled that so well, too. And yeah, I'm thinking about that. Hobo Wars, probably a whole generation, maybe several, really don't know what that is. We lived across from our road tracks, and we had that situation with, with hobos. And I can remember one day going to the back door, and a hobo was at the back door wanting some food. And I remember that like it was two days ago, and it was a lot longer than that. So they really made an impression on you, didn't they? Yes, they, they really did. Uh, just as Bobby did and um, our little group of friends. Uh, we were very close and very different, but we, we were at that very, very critical time when little boys are about to become boys, not yet big boys. Um, and, they're very, and they're still attached to their mothers. And they're in the process of distancing themselves from their mothers. In retrospect, that's a very interesting thing, especially now, having, having had two children of my own, seeing what that was like and the kinds of lessons involved in that process. It was interesting. You spent some time, you mentioned uh, young people, you mentioned some time hiding from the little girls and the babysitters. You had these little forts that you would, uh, that, that Joe would, with his friends would go off to. You were hiding from them during that period. <laughs> oh boy, were we hiding from them. <laughs> yeah. Little boys had no use for little girls <laughs> and even less use for babysitters. <laughs> <laughs> so you had your they own were, little... They were the well, yeah, and you had your own little escape area where we you could go and be there. And I think everybody thinks back and go, yeah, I can relate to that. I understand exactly what he's talking about. It's interesting you say it's the book is about being a little boy, not about growing up. Talk about that a little bit more because sometimes we force this into growing up. We grow up on our own fast enough. We need more time being little boys, don't we? Well, I really tried to express the voice of a little boy in the book. And I will tell you, Siri, who had to read the book many times in order to proof it for me, because I'm a, I, I can be a terrible writer, I will tell you. Um, I would hear her laughing over and over again, knowing that she's read this, read the book several times, and she is still laughing at the, what's going <laughs> on. <laughs> um, but it's really, that time was so interesting and so important and our world was so small, but we thought it was so big. Yes. And the transitions that were taking place, I see now much later in my life, but at the time we were just so focused on the present. And that was a very, very special thing. We had the Blackberry patch, which you know is described in the book. And, where we, we could crawl in underneath the blackberry patch and nobody could get in there, and especially babysitters and parents. <laughs> and, of course, we had to dig the china hole, which all little boys did oh, in those yes. days. <laughs> you know, reading this book, and you were age six, seven, and eight as you go back and, and capture those memories, 
you you capture as well the voice of, of a young boy in a charming way. What was that like in, in memories? You really make it feel like this just happened to you a couple of weeks ago, and you remember it, and you're going to go ahead and write it down. And those were decades ago. What was it about those those memories and having that voice of a, of a boy that you were able to, to recapture for the book? You know, I have to tell you that, Last night we were watching a movie on the television and I was, I was very aware at how frequently the F word came up. Yes. Now in the book, frequently these little boys would say, and I wrote, ah, oh, geez. <laughs> and I still, I still say, ah, oh, geez. <laughs> It's just part of the little boy's vocabulary. And it was important to me to, and, and a joy to go back to the time when those kinds of expressions were so innocent. It just, oh, geez. <laughs> everything, yeah. everything was simpler. And it was such a pleasure. Every day was a new adventure. It was just, it, it was just terrific. And I hope other people really get the understanding of, of how funny these anecdotes are, but in some ways, very, very profound. Well, and they are both. Yes. And I mentioned that. Go ahead. You were going to say something in particular. Well, when we finally realized that one of our boys, we never saw his father and we wondered why, but he wouldn't explain. And we really didn't like him very much when he didn't explain. Eventually, we found out that they were divorced. In those days, we didn't know anybody who was divorced. We finally met his father when his mother and his father came together for his birthday and had a birthday party for all of us. It was a wonderful thing. And his father spoke to us and told us he had been in the war and he was a soldier. And it was very, very difficult. I want to tell you that that, that, that that touched our hearts. All those stories come to life in Joseph's memoir. The book is Little Boys, Big Dreams, and the Hobo Wars. Joseph Kinnebrew, that's K-I-N-N-E-B-R-E-W, book available at uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and in all formats, all the usual places. And you'll find information on our website, thisweekinamerica.us. His website is josephkinnebrew.com. I want to go back and touch on something else you mentioned, so many relationships that unfold in, in, in your book. Talk about the relationship with 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 mothers. What, is, what was that like growing up six, seven, eight years old, and you love being outdoors and maybe hiding from time to time and uh, you, you're trying to balance that with uh, being obedient to your mother what was what was the relationship you had with the with your mother relationship with our mothers well my mother was a very unusual person in, in for m many reasons and the world her word was law um we didn't see a, an awful lot of my father because he was working hard in his in, in his new business, but it was sort of this strange d disconnect. It's it, it has long been my my thought that when little boys basically are in the mother's tent in the beginning, and at some point the mothers know that they have to take them to the door and the men are. This is a this is a very traumatic time for little boys. They don't really realize it, but but they need to disconnect. And that that is a very important process in their lives and will affect their lives and their attitudes towards women, I believe, for the rest of the time. So even though we were attached to our mothers, we were becoming more independent. I sometimes wonder what that must have been like for our mothers. I mean, uh, yes. How did they think about it? And <laughs> I, watched my, I watched my wife uh, experience that with our son so gently and with such sensitivity. I, I admire it greatly. But having been there and having experienced that, um, we didn't fear our mothers, but we knew that 
that increasingly we needed to do our own thing. And sometimes we needed to be very secretive about it. <laughs> That's part of six, seven, eight is having that secretive uh, part of your life. And uh, you, you bring that uh, so much to life as, as you're reading this. It's a delightful, charming book. The book is available, A Little Boy's Big Dreams and Hobo Wars by Joseph Kennebrew, wherever books are sold. I want to touch on, I go back to Bobby and the hobos here because you take subjects that uh, Bobby, you were somewhat uh, standoffish in the beginning because you weren't sure because of what he had, who Bobby was as a person. You found out and became close with him. Hobos the same way. Talk about that uh, with Bobby and the hobos and, and how your attitude changed and you realize these are just people like the rest of us. Well, first of all, Bobby was older than us, um, considerably older. Um, I would guess, retrospectively, I would guess he was probably in his late 20s, early 30s. He was infirmed in a chair. Um, he couldn't speak properly. Um, the chair was very peculiar in and of itself. His father had built that for him. And when we, sometimes he would come down the block, down the sidewalk, and we would see him but we would never go near him because he looks very scary to us. And finally, when we got closer to us and he made a gesture towards us, he, he would sort of raise his hands and, and with very little control over them and make a noise, which was terribly frightening to us. I, I will tell you, it's, it scared the hell out of us. Yes. But eventually, we went closer to him, just over a period of time, we got closer and closer and got to know him better. And the most amazing thing was how understanding and he always had a smile on his face, always. And increasingly, we shared our adventures with him. And he, he we would nod his head and he would smile at us. And sometimes he would try to gesture and even in the, in the beginning, because that was frightening to us, we started to accept that. We started to understand that he was very different from us. We understood that he couldn't come with us on some of our adventures. And that, that was something we found joy and pleasure in sharing with him, helping them to understand what the hobos were doing. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> sometimes having two breakfasts because in a, in a single day because they would go to two houses to get breakfast. And he understood. And somehow he was able to communicate to us a level of understanding and acceptance that we, we, we didn't see the requirement for in the rest of our lives. It, 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 his lesson was so profound and I, I cannot tell you the gratitude that I feel today for what he gave us. Even though he was apparently so infirmed, he couldn't be physically active. But I must tell you, he was an enormous influence for each of us. Well, and the book brings this out, and it's a message for all of us, no matter our age, not to initially judge people, because you, at a very early age, you were astute enough to know that, you know, you gave Bobby a chance, and you had a, a friendship with him. The hobo was the same way. You found that they were just real people, and you were not on your way to Arabia later that night in a suitcase in the back of a, a railroad guard. So there's so much in the book that is, uh, and I wish we had hours to talk about it. A few minutes later, left in the program. I want to talk about the ending because a few memoirs end in such a gentle, graceful way with a profound message. Tell me how you feel about how you were then, how you feel now as a person, a person referred to as a genuine creative genius. And that all came from that, that foundation that you talk about in the book. How does that uh, all make you feel? And talk about the ending of the memoir. Well, I think at the end, I won't, I, 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 I wrote some things about our relationship with girls who would become women. Um, because so much of the book, we, it sounds almost uh, like we were misogynists. I don't feel that's the way we were, but it's a, it was a curious transition how our, our, our reaction to females would change. 
um, it, it, that too is a fascinating process. And we would learn to um, treat women with respect um, and admiration and have them understand, have us understand that to this day, at least I can say for myself, they still, present company accepted, are a great mystery. <laughs> great mystery. They were then and they continue to be. But our, as we became young men and then men, our attitudes would change, particularly with our reaction to, to what were little girls at the time and now women. That's an interesting process, and I think a lot, a lot of us would do well to think a little bit more about that, since we see some abuses in life and some things that we wish would change. I hope that message came through at the end and was a very positive and encouraging message to tell us we are capable of doing much better than sometimes we presently do. The message is delivered and it will, you will pause and you will think, and this is, this is good. You'll reflect on, on your life and where you are now and where possibly you, you came from. I got a minute or so left here. I want to talk about maybe the differences between those times and our time. And I'm saying that because you are listed as a genuine creative genius. You grew up without the internet. You grew up without, uh, you know, having a, a computer in front of you with the, with the screen. You did this all on your own. Talk about the difference between then and now. I hear people say so frequently, things are so much more complicated now. I don't believe that. I believe in a relative sense, the changes that we experience and sometimes frustrate us have been with us forever. It's just that they are different um, in the sense that our relationship to them that seems so complicated to some people and sometimes they feel very discouraged by that. Our, our reasons for us to consider the things around us that have benefited us. For, for, as an example, we're for frequent, right now we're going through this big brouhaha about AI. AI has been around for a long, long time. It has been a part of our lives. It's in our refrigerators, it's in our cars, it's in our computers. But in a relative sense, we, I have the belief that we will survive this, this change, this challenge to us. I object to the idea that it is considered to be artificial intelligence as opposed to intelligence. That's an arrogance, I think. But what we learn and what we see as these things evolve is that we benefit in many ways, and yes, there are those who will abuse these new developments. Yep, yes. And that—that's that's that's historical. Unfortunately, people don't understand that historical perspective very well, and I and that I find is a is a very serious flaw, because we seem more interested in ourselves and complaining than we do in trying to be a participant in improving things. Well said. That's so important what uh, Joseph just said. And so many lessons come out of his books. And uh, art, we could spend a couple of hours talking about his artwork, and I would love to be able to do that at some point. And I understand you're working on another book. You've got The Orchard. Is that ready to, uh, to be published? That will be published this month. That is a very challenging book. The Orchard is about justice. It's about the justice system. Um, and at the same time, I'm, that's, that I finished up and is being published this month, but I'm working on another book on truth. I write a lot of books that people are not terribly interested in reading, and I understand that. <laughs> I write because I'm interested in the subject and I'm interested in exploring it. it if they don't sell, that really doesn't bother me much at all. 
Well, in the books have been the ones that have been published. And I understand Surrey has worked with you in getting the books out there and published and available and uh, resonating very well with people. And I'm looking forward to the two new books. Fascinating topics, and would love to talk about those. Uh, those as well. The time has gone by way too quickly. Our guest on the program is Joseph Kinnebrew, K-I-N-N-E-B-R-E-W. The book is a uh, memoir, Little Boys, Big Dreams, and the Hobo Wars. You'll find the book available at Amazon, the usual places. We thank kingpagespress.com for arranging our conversation today. They're the uh, marketing consultant for Joseph, and we thank uh, Suri Strubel for being with us, director of uh, uh, Kenner Brew Studios. A pleasure having both of you with us. Hopefully we can do this again. Thank you so much. Uh, wonderful stories back in the days when uh, the F word was fort rather than what it is today. Those were kinder and gentler days. Joseph, thank you for sharing all those stories with us on the program. I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome. And once again, information on Joseph's book, Little Boys, Big Dreams, and the Hobo Wars, you'll find on our website, thisweekinamerica.us. And we're back on today's program right after these messages. This Week in America is online. You can visit our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Scott Pinkerton, associate producer of This Week in America. Jay Anderson, segment producer. Ben Watson, webmaster. Otto Bache, director of engineering and TV production. This Week in America produced and is a trademark of Blue Funk Broadcasting, LLC. For information on all of our guests and to listen to this week's show, our website again at thisweekinamerica.us. And I'm Sean Bratton, executive producer of This Week in America.